Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez, Minister of Finance of Jamaica, Dr. the Honorable Peter Phillips, or visitors for the conference, many of whom I see scattered throughout the audience, ladies and gentlemen, all. It is with pleasure that on behalf of Solisis, the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies, I wish to welcome you to the conference Beyond Westminster in the Caribbean, Critiques, Challenges, and Reform. This is the second of a two-part series critically exploring the history, contemporary state, and future direction of the Commonwealth Caribbean constitutional and political systems. The first, held almost exactly a year ago in London, was entitled Assessing Westminster in the Caribbean, Then and Now, and pulled together, as this one has also done, a distinguished group of scholars working on matters related to government, governance, and politics in the region. This conference has the additional advantage, I must say, of not only produce, uh, uh, pulling together scholars, but scholar politicians in the form of some of our uh, uh, participants present here today. Some of you who were at the first event are here with us again today, and as I said before, I warmly wish to welcome you. None of us will forget the typically rich, investigative, and cutting opening plenary from Norman Gervin, and it is with great sadness that we have to note that he is no longer with us today. Rest in peace, Norman. That conference looked at the history of the Westminster parliamentary model as it has been applied in its various forms in the Caribbean, examined con comparatively the various modifications and reforms as they have emerged over the years, and sought to some extent to explore what were the feasible opportunities and prospects for moderate or more radical reform in the future. This event seeks to continue that conversation with similar themes, though as the title suggests, it is hoped that emphasis would be placed on the forward-looking lens as we seek to advance positions that might ultimately influence policymakers and the direction of politics throughout the region. Critiques coming from the Caribbean of the adopted Westminster system, first past the post-elections and the sitting government's prerogative to call elections, cabinet government, indeed prime ministerial government, unelected upper houses, at best quasi-independent judiciaries, not to mention monarchical sovereignty and the like, have been many and often caustic. Attempts at reform have also been numerous, including in the sweep of history, the Guyanese Cooperative Republic presidential model, the Grenadian revolutionary experience, more conservative republicanism in Trinidad and Tobago and Dominica, and many smaller incremental modifications in Jamaica, Belize, and the Eastern Caribbean. It is, however, sobering to note that the thoroughgoing attempts at reform in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, accompanied by a significant public education drive, were defeated in referendum, and we're fortunate to have the Prime Minister who initiated that process here with us today. Many of the smallest territories remain under British rule, and for most, there has been little departure from the model established by the Jamaican Ordering Council of more than 50 years ago. Does this reality speak to the resilience of Westminster in the Caribbean, or is it that the birth of something new, with all the implications thereof, has been dangerously postponed? And what, given the partial and some would argue seriously reformed seriously flawed reforms of the past might a new agenda look like? Is Westminster in itself, with its encouragement of a politics of militant oppositionism, self-sustaining in its conservatism and resistance to change? It is, of course, not my duty this morning to answer or even pose all the relevant questions, but I hope that they will emerge and that this gathering will seek to interrogate and address many of them. This event and the Westminster in the Caribbean network, of which it is a part, 
would not have been possible without my joint collaborator, Kate Quinn, who sits uh, to the right of uh, Dr. Phillips. Kate is that rare British academic who in the early 21st century, when all scholarly eyes in the UK seem to be trained on North and South America, Asia, or even Africa, has focused on the Caribbean. Back in, I think, 2007, she called me out of the blue and asked if I would be interested in working with her on a grant for a conference on black power. We did, and the product of that very successful uh, two-part conference was the book on Black Power in the Caribbean, which will be launched tomorrow afternoon. It was Kate again who initiated the discussion around the possibility of a conference on the Westminster experience. And to cut a very long story short, here we are again. So it, was, it is with very great pleasure that I ask Dr. Kate Quinn of the Institute of the Americas, University College London, to say a few words. Kate. Prime Minister, Minister, distinguished speakers and delegates, um, thank you very much, uh, Brian, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Brian Meeks, um, Christine Crew, and all of the team at Salises for all of their work in putting this conference together and for um, shielding me from any organizational stress. Um, it's been fantastic to have the chance to collaborate again with you, Brian, and uh, with the University of the West Indies, um, which always puts on such um, well-organized, hospitable, and intellectually invigorating events. I'd also like to thank the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the AHRC UK, um, whose research grant funded this research network and the conference series, as well as, again, the University of the West Indies for all of their generous material, administrative, and myriad other forms of support um, for hosting this event. Um, as Professor Meeks has indicated, this conference is, um, well, the second, or some would say uh, the, it could also be the third in a series of conferences assessing the experiences of Westminster, uh, the Westminster model of governance in the Caribbean in both historical and contemporary perspective. As many of you in this room will know, um, scholarship assessing the record of Westminster in the Caribbean began in earnest in the late um, 1980s and early 1990s when some Caribbean nations were reaching their quarter century of independence. This early scholarship um, focused mainly on the formal dimensions of democracy and on the whole took a positive view of the model's effectiveness in producing stable democratic states in the region. And this positive view has tended to be reinforced in quantitative assessments of the region in global rankings, such as, for example, the worldwide governance indicators which rank the 12 independent states of the Commonwealth Caribbean above all other so-called developing world regions on all of their chosen indicators, including voice and accountability, political stability, um, control of corruption, and rule of law. Yet clearly there is another side to this story. In the last few decades, the region has undergone radical changes, which bring into question the more optimistic assessments of the earlier scholarship and the surface view offered by such governance rankings. As some scholars in the region have argued, neoliberal globalization, the transnational drugs trade, trade, rising crime levels, debt, and the economic downturn all pose significant threats to Caribbean sovereignty and the power of the state. Indeed, some have argued that liberal democracy, which the Westminster model was assumed to produce, is in terminal decline. So in the light of um, current debates about political reform um, in the region, it's timely, therefore, to revisit the question of the Westminster model and its application in the Caribbean. So as, as Brian has already indicated, the three conferences in this series address the need for an expanded and an updated analysis of the experience of Westminster in the Caribbean, examining the historical roots and legacies of the model, assessing its impact on Caribbean democracy, and questioning the utility, viability, and even the legitimacy of the model as the region weighs up various options for political and constitutional reform. The first conference, entitled Assessing Westminster in the Caribbean Then and Now, 
um, was held in London in September 2013. And this conference explored how the Westminster model was transplanted and adapted to the Caribbean context and assessed some of the limitations and the achievements um, of the model in consolidating democracy in the years since independence. We were immensely privileged to host the late great Professor Norman German, Gervin, whose opening keynote lit up the conference and set the scene for two days of intense debate. Professor Gervin's paper, reflecting on 50 years of independence, criticised the exclusionary nature of the independence pact forged between the departing colonisers and the local political elite and called for a broader conceptualization of Caribbean sovereignty based on genuine empowerment of the people. A further conference held in London in March 2014 turned to the non-independent Caribbean, assessing in particular um, current political developments in the UK overseas territories where the more direct relationship with Westminster has brought ambiguous benefits as well as peculiar vulnerabilities. As the recent case of the Turks and Caicos illustrates, the days of direct rule from London have not been consigned to the colonial past. At these conferences, a number of questions were debated, including, just to name a few, one, um, the anti-democratic legacies um, of Westminster in the colonial and post-colonial context. Can the so-called distortions of Westminster in the Caribbean region be seen as distortions or rather the persistence in new forms of the non-democratic core at the heart of the model itself. Two, questions of inclusion and exclusion, participation and representation. Who benefits from the maintenance of the system? How have women fared within its institutions and political culture? And what are its implications in multi-ethnic states? Three, Comparative lessons, how has the model functioned elsewhere and what lessons might the Caribbean draw from this? And four, where do we go from here? And it's this latter question in particular that we turn to in the present conference and I very much look forward to hearing the debates over the next two days. But before I hand over to Brian for the main business of the day, I, I would also like to, to acknowledge once again the towering contribution of Professor Norman Gervin. It's impossible to consider the themes of Caribbean democracy and governance without reference to his outstanding work. His lifelong commitment to envisioning new Caribbean futures is something that I hope this conference can acknowledge and pay tribute to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I wish to welcome um, Two persons who have just come into the room, former Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Bruce Golding, uh, who is our, our speaker for tomorrow morning. Uh, welcome, sir. And Minister Morris Guy, who has uh, come in, and uh, we're very happy to have you here, sir. Very happy to have you here. Um, I, I just want, before I get to the main business of the day, to encourage those of you who have only come to hear the keynote speaker, that we have a very, very rich, a very, very rich two days of uh, activities here. Please look at your conference program. I shall not go into all the details, and I, I hesitate to single out anyone, but let me say that we have a mixture of some of the people who have been working on this question from the er early days of, of, of the independence constitutions. Uh, right through to a younger generation who are, who are working on these issues today. Uh, and welcome Ambassador uh, Richard Bernal. Yeah. Um, uh, and and we, we, we do um, hope that you will find the time to attend the sessions. This afternoon we have um, uh, the keynote address will be from uh, Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzalez at five o'clock. Although we're starting quite late this morning, we try to make up on time. And tomorrow morning, uh, Mr. Bruce Golding will be giving the opening address on the second day of batting. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce someone who is perhaps too well known to this audience to be given the long formal introduction. Um, in fact, he told me when he saw the length of my uh, resume in front of me that please don't do that. And that is in his nature because he's not a man for for um, pomp and circumstance. Uh, Dr. Peter 
David Phillips is, of course, currently the Minister of Finance and Planning, has had a distinguished career in government in a number of ministries, including, of course, his present uh, portfolio, but also before that, uh, the Minister of National Security, before that, Minister of Transport and Works, uh, and a stint as Minister of Health, and uh, in each of these, he has distinguished himself. Uh, before that, many people may not know that he was actually one of uh, my, and I, I can say for the rest of us who were around at the time, one of our colleagues at the University of the West Indies in the Department of Government and later the Consortium Graduate School uh, of the Social Sciences right here, which was, by the way, one of the uh, progenitors of our uh, Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. He is a graduate of uh, the University of the West Indies and of State University of New York at Binghamton, um, where he was taught by, I, I, I hesitate to say, came under the influence of Emmanuel Wallerstein. Um, <laughs> some people might find that interesting. Um, and uh, is, of course, <coughs> needs no further introduction to utter an obvious statement. So. I would like now to ask uh, Dr. Peter Phillips uh, to, to come to the podium to deliver his paper, Westminster Politics, Democratic Practice and Social Constraints, the Jamaican Experience. Dr. Phillips. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, let me recognize former Prime Minister Bruce Golding, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzales, uh, and Trevor Monroe, Maurice Guy, my colleague in the cabinet, and all the, all the other um, distinguished persons here. I, I, when I looked through the program earlier, so Ralph was going to be here, Bruce was going to be here, yourself, I, I, I said, you know, I remember us gathering in October 1968. <laughs> I don't know. Bruce didn't gather. <laughs> no, he did. I was watching you. <laughs> actually, actually, the night before, he did gather. And maybe at a, maybe at a, <laughs> maybe at a future conference we can record our personal recollections. But, but, but to be accurate, he, pre he helped prevent Sherry from deporting me. He helped you. <laughs> Much good that did you. Or indeed him. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know if we are gathered here for a protest again. <laughs> but certainly, if we protest, we protest from an entirely different vantage point. Um, I, I, I must say that this, my, my, I hastily accepted Brian's invitation to prepare a paper, but the closer the time came, the more terrified I became about the prospect of, um, of, of, uh, presenting before the academic community once again without the, for all kinds of reasons. Except to say that at least I, I, I still relish the, the, the freedom of the academic situation because when you make errors, you just simply come the next time and say, I've changed my view. <laughs> I don't have that liberty in my other undertakings. <laughs> but, but to some extent, this, is, this, this reflects, not self-consciously, but, but inevitably, uh, a, a, a reflection born of some experience, some reconsideration even, of, of, of earlier thoughts and positions. And as, as you have indicated, I've entitled it Westminster Politics, Democratic Practice, and Social Constraints. 
and have reflected on the Jamaican experience. I think it is generally well recognized that among what used to be known as the new states in the literature of the 50s and 60s, the so-called Commonwealth Caribbean states that achieved independence in the 60s and 70s have, by and large, sustained their democratic traditions. Unlike some other states that were formerly part of the British Empire that assumed independent status around the same time, the Commonwealth Caribbean states, with few exceptions, probably one or one and a half, have sustained constitutional rule, held regular elections, changed administrations by way of the ballot, maintained independent judiciaries, and have sustained independent civil services and preserved, not perfectly, but preserved nevertheless the basic rights of the individual citizen. Specifically in relation to Jamaica, there have been 16 general elections held since the introduction of universal adult suffrage in 1944, resulting in seven changes of government. Universal adult suffrage preceded the assumption of independent statehood, but even so, the basic political and administrative underpinnings of the Westminster Whitehall model of liberal democracy were to be sustained. Since the assumption of independent statehood in 1962, the country has maintained a cadre of impartial, politically neutral civil servants, including an independent judiciary, and has maintained individual rights and of freedom of association, freedom of assembly, mm -hmm. free speech, etc., which are at the core of modern liberal democratic political practice. As compared with other post-colonial Commonwealth jurisdictions, the durability of the Westminster model in the Caribbean is notable. Unlike much of Africa, such as Ghana and Nigeria in West Africa, or Kenya and Tanzania in East, where the Westminster inheritance quickly yielded to military government or one-party rule. In hindsight, perhaps this should not seem so surprising. Africa, with its checkerboard of competing ethnic loyalties and surviving traditional political institutions and ideologies, provided a vastly different social and institutional backdrop to post-colonial politics than did the Caribbean. And I dare say that applies also to parts of formerly colonial Asia. Moreover, it is the case in the Caribbean that in form, if not in substance, Westminster patterns have long been exemplified in colonial administration. From the 17th century onwards, a local assembly comprised of planters and their managers exercised political authority alongside an appointed governor who constituted the apex of executive authority. This pattern was disrupted by the Morant Bay Rebellion of 1865, which, which in a sense was a manifestation of the claim of the so-called free coloreds and newly emancipated blacks for participation in political decision making. And as a consequence of the, the urgency or the t form that that claim took, direct rule by, colon by the colonial office was instituted, but was to be short-lived. After the reintroduction of restricted suffrage in the 1880s, the political forms of representative government were to be revived. The essential point to be emphasized here is that unlike Africa or Asia, the transplanted populations that made up the Caribbean had no other indigenous political models to look to. Indeed, in large measure, the quest for expanded rights of citizenship and social development championed by progressive advocates going as far back as Dr. Robert Love in the 1880s and including persons like Marcus Garvey, J.G. Smith, and N.W. Manley, that quest was to be a demand for inclusion within the ambit of the representative politics of the day. Love, Garvey, and Smith in particular, 
experienced different degrees of success with seats in the local assembly, in Garvey's case, the parochial board, on the restricted franchise of the time. Garvey was the first to enunciate the demand for universal adult suffrage in his platform of the PPP in 1929, a demand ultimately realized in the 1944 Constitution. Without doubt, the impetus for the expansion of adult suffrage and for more quote-unquote responsible government was the labor riots of 1938 and the emergence of modern party politics which it precipitated. First with the formation of the People's National Party in the immediate aftermath of the upheavals and later with the formation of the Jamaica Labor Party in 1943. The elections of 1944 which were won by the Jamaica Labour Party, ushered in a new phase of mass political participation in Jamaica. The political topography, which was to define Jamaica's constitutional arrangements and political practice in the ensuing years up to independence and beyond, were all prefigured in that constitution. There was to be a bicameral legislature comprised of an appointed legislative council and an elected House of Representatives. Executive authority was concentrated in a governor appointed by the British Colonial Office, assisted by an executive council, and administrative responsibilities exercised by heads of department under the guidance of a colonial secretary. The legislature and the political life of the country was by virtue of the expanded suffrage to be dominated by two main political parties, each with a trade union affiliate. The so-called responsible government, defined in terms of elected representatives providing direction to the administrators of government, was not a feature of the 1944 Constitution. That was to emerge through successive constitutional adjustments, culminating in the assumption of full internal self-government in 19. 57 and independent statehood in 1962. Significantly, however, in the context of the considerable popular agitation and national ferment of the time, there was never any popularly voiced demand for an alternative to the Westminster type constitutional order. Since 1962, there have been spasmodic attempts at constitutional reform Initiated in earnest in the late 1970s, these efforts reached a high point in the 1990s with the appointment of a constitutional commission in 1992, broadly representative of the main political parties and key stakeholders drawn from civil society. Subsequent to its report, a joint select committee of parliament was to consider and make recommendations. To date, however, with the exception of the promulgation of a new Charter of Rights, there has been no substantial movement on the recommendations of the Parliamentary Committee. More pertinent to the issues under consideration here, however, is the fact that despite suggestions being mooted initially by the PNP for an executive presidency and subsequent proposals for a complete separation of powers modeled on the United States Constitution, the consensus finally settled on by the Joint Select Committee of Parliament was for a retention of the essential features of the existing constitutional order. Moreover, as I have indicated, there has never been any sustained popular demand for substantial changes to the Westminster institutional forms. One set of specific thanks. One set of specific concerns raised about the nature of the constitutional order and wider political arrangements was the extent to which constitutional, constitutionally guaranteed rights were actually being enjoyed by the populations. In this view, for example, constitutional guarantees of equal treatment before the courts or against arbitrary arrest or the right to life, etc., have been denied to many by virtue of uh, police excesses, for example, or the, or the arbitrary exercise of state power in other ways. A problem still with us. 
the remedy for these and other risks of arbitrary and excessive action by state authorities was deemed for the most part to be protected to a greater degree by the promulgation of a new charter of fundamental rights and freedoms guaranteeing all rights quote typical of a free and democratic society and supporting their observance by the establishment of the office by the establishment of the office of a public defender charged with the general protection and defense of citizens' rights. Critical though these issues are, perhaps a more fundamental and certainly a more persistent critique of the system of government relates to the quality of governance enjoyed by citizens as a whole. If good governance is defined as, and I quote, the exercise of power by various levels of government in a manner that is effective, honest, equitable, transparent, and accountable, then by this measure, the post-independence experience of Jamaica has been severely deficient. There's an extensive literature outlining the dimensions of this deficit and the extent to which, as, as Professor Gladstone Mills put it, the Jamaican reality falls short of the ideals of Western liberal democracy. And I'm, I'm quoting from his Grace Kennedy Foundation lecture. There have been two main vectors to this critique. The first points to the disfigurement of politics by excessive partisanship and the consequential manifestations of political violence, manipulation of the electoral system, the emergence of so-called garrison communities. A further dimension of this problem relates to the supposed or purported efforts of political parties to politicize the civil service and security forces and other institutions of state in order to secure partisan advantage. The second main vector of the critique concerns the issue of the lack of accountability growing corruption in public life and declining ethical norms. Repeated studies, both from international bodies such as Transparency International and from local uh, academic institutions, CAPRI to name one, have confirmed the widespread public perception that corruption is a significant and worsening problem in the country. This is generally taken to refer to the use of public office for private gain. The term is also used in reference to a wide range of misdeeds uh, extending beyond the centers of political authority and influence, including, for example, the sale of public goods such as drivers, licenses, customs, clearances, certificates of fitness for motor vehicles, uh, etc. And the, the, the term refers to situations like that, to presumably more egregious circumstances involving presumed alliances between criminal organizations and individuals uh, seated in positions of power and between such organizations and political parties or elected representatives. Undoubtedly, these several and manifold threats to good governance have been severe, and in some instances, as in the case of political violence and electoral malpractice, have threatened the basic political stability of the country and the integrity of the, of the constitutional order. Yet, from our current vantage point, what is most striking to me from this vantage point, as distinct from the vantage point of 1968, has been the striking capacity of the political system to reform. Certainly some efforts at reform have been more successful and far-reaching than others. Among the more successful measures of reform was the formation of the Electoral Advisory Committee, which subsequently evolved into an electoral commission. This took electoral administration out of the hands of direct governmental administration and placed it with an independent commission with a majority of so-called independent members drawn from civil society. 
the summary effect of this and various ancillary reform measures initiated by the Commission, regard, such as the power to void electoral results marred by violence, the power to demarcate constituency boundaries, etc., has been a steady reduction of incidents of political violence to negligible levels since the, depending on how you define it, the low point or high point of the 1980 elections. Similarly, the passage of ordinary legislation codifying the autonomy of the Commission of Police with respect to operational decisions and the implementation of other reforms, including the establishment of an anti-corruption branch and an informal agreement to secure bipartisan consensus regarding the appointment of a police services commission have rolled back the perceived specter of a politicized police force. And I dare say that that, along with stepped up international cooperation, has resulted in greater operational efficiencies. One fundamental consequence of all of this has been to reverse the onslaught of organized crime linked to the international trade in illegal narcotics and thereby reduce, if not entirely, eliminate what had been a burgeoning link between political parties and organized criminal groups. Progress in the battle against corruption and its threat to good governance has not been as clear cut. Corrupt conduct by public officials, including elected representatives and the potential threat implied to public institutions and the integrity of the political process has been longstanding. Certainly, it has been around from the inception of independent statehood and even, into the e and even extends back into the era of internal self-government. Beginning with the passage of the Parliamentary Integrity Act of 1973, there have been numerous and significant legislative initiatives focused on this problem. These include the Contractor General Act of 1986 and the establishment of the Office of the Contractor General to oversee the public procurement process, the Corruption Prevention Act of 2003, which established the Corruption Prevention Commission and required public officials other than parliamentarians to provide annual re reports as to their financial status. Access to information legislation was also passed, permitting greater transparency for public decisions. Yet for all this, the problem persists. It is manifest in the public perception that high degrees of public corruption exist. And persists as it can only do in small society settings where stark and I dare say grotesque displays of wealth by public officials and rumors of misbehavior by public officials continue without any prosecutions or convictions of senior public officials. One remedy proposed and currently being pursued is for a single anti-corruption agency to be established which would combine investigative functions with some prosecutorial authority. Viewed from the perspective of long historical time, however, the greatest potential threat to the stability of the constitutional order and the institutional underpinnings of the political system has been its persistent inability to deliver sustained economic growth and employment, sufficient to satisfy the aspirations of the majority of the population. The numbers are stark and sobering. For 40 years, the average annual growth rate of GDP has been less than 1%. Over the same period, the public debt has risen by more than 600% amounting in 2013 to close to 150% of GDP, making Jamaica one of the most highly indebted countries in the world. In turn, the resultant low growth and stagnating per capita incomes are the root of many of the social ills confronted by Jamaica over the same period. Serious crime, including murder, have risen sharply propelled to a significant degree by Jamaica's emergence in the 1980s and 90s as a platform for, international, for an international narcotics trade flowing between South America and North America. 
In turn, this helped to spawn organized criminal networks which sought to enhance, to embrace marginalized urban youth within their compass. An increasingly overwhelmed court system and underfunded social services all helped to reinforce a vicious cycle of economic underperformance and social marginalization. All of this experience of high debt buildup and economic underperformance, social marginalization, etc., begs the question as to whether there is any feature of the country's constitutional arrangements and political practice which underlie these phenomena. Certainly, we may ask the same question in relation to the issues of political violence, electoral malpractice, corruption, etc., which emerged at various times as threats to the political system and constitutional stability. What seems clear from the documented historical experience is that excessive partnership termed political tribalism in the popular vernacular, expressed in the quest for power, has been a con continuing feature of our political practice. Violence perpetrated in the search for electoral advantage, for example, or the creation of geographically distinct, politically homogenous garrison communities in which uniformity of party allegiance is enforced by the threat of physical violence is all antithetical to the basic assumptions underlying Westminster political practice. As noted Trinidadian political scientist Selwyn Ryan makes clear, and I quote, a most important assumption of the Westminster paradigm is that society is socially and institutionally homogenous, and that its basic values and behavioral notions are, quote, widely, if not universally shared. Competitors for power must share a common view as to the rules of the game, not only with respect to the requirements of the contest itself, that is, with respect to the electoral process, but also with respect to how power is to be exercised subsequently. It is this assumption of common interest which prompted Edmund Burke to observe in 18th century England, and I quote him, that Parliament is not a Congress of ambassadors from different hostile interests, which interest must each, which interest each must maintain as an agent and advocate against the other agents and advocates. Parliament is a deliberative assembly of one nation with one interest, that of the whole. The ideal as described by Burke may never have been attained even in Britain and will always have of necessity an asymptotic quality pursued but never completely attained. The fact is, however, that the prospects for attaining the ideal would be very much affected by the social environment in which the parliament existed. In the case of Britain, parliament and its deliberative traditions and the solidarities, the social solidarities of nationhood had a long history preceding the formation of strong and institutionalized political party loyalties. In the vastly different socio-historical context of the Caribbean, however, defined as it was by strong subcultural divisions and sharply inscribed race class hierarchies, the prospect of the emergence of a core of shared national values and interests would have been sharply curtailed. Moreover, as Carl Stone pointed out in a pioneering work, political participation generally in the context of a highly unequal pattern of income distribution took place primarily on the basis of political clientelism and the search for individual benefits through party structures. To quote him, the very idea of politics is for most members of the mass public synonymous with party politics. In any event, mass participation in the electoral process in Jamaica took place simultaneously with the formation of political parties, and party loyalties were often stronger than loyalties to the collective, a collective which I dare say 
it emerged as a functioning sovereign entity more than two decades after the formation of the two main political parties that came to dominate the political life of the country. Viewed from this vantage point, the viability of the Westminster style political institutions and the establishment of successful nationhood has depended on the society's capacity to curb the excesses of partisanship and sectoral interests in favor of the collective. What is more, and somewhat ironic in the context of a system of party politics that emerged from the demands of civil society groups like the networks of the National Reform Associations and other welfare groups and neighborhood associations and the trade unions which reached a crescendo in the activism of the 1930s. The political parties, however, once formed, tended to diminish, if not destroy, independent civic organizations and activity. Independent organizations of teachers, farmers, trade unions, student organizations, etc., were all subordinated to or permeated by the competition between the two main political parties to the point where most, if not all, lost the reputation and oftentimes the capacity for independent action. In recent years, this tendency has subsided somewhat. And, there's, and one might say has even in many instances been reversed. The establishment of the Jamaican Confederation of Trade Unions, the reinvigoration of human rights and environmental movements independent of the political parties have been among the more recent examples of this counter tendency, which has occurred alongside a long-term trend of lessening hardcore party loyalties on the part of adherents to the two main parties. What then is the way forward in the face of the country's post-independence experience of constitutional arrangements. As a prelude to suggesting any plan of action, we should first of all acknowledge that the basic institutional structure of the so-called Westminster system has deep organic roots in Jamaica's history. The population has over hundred of year, hundreds of years fought battles to be included within its ambit. The basic institutional structures and the associated roles and responsibilities are universally understood and it has functioned well as a system for preserving basic democratic rights and freedoms. Not perfectly, but well. Moreover, as we have sought to argue, the political system as a whole and the critical social sector and critical social sectors have over time successfully withstood and transcended all fundamental threats to systemic integrity and survival that have presented themselves. We have also argued that the root of all the major systemic threats that have arisen relate to the extent of partisan loyalties which have exceeded loyalty to the collective and which have their foundation in the historically rooted social inequalities of plantation society and cultural pluralism which together have inhibited the emergence of the critical solidarities essential to nationhood. It would follow from this that in charting a course to follow, the objective should be to constrain and mute the opportunities for the exercise of partisan advantage by party political authorities managing the state. Equally, Future stability and the effectiveness of the constitutional order would seem to be dependent on the widening of the ambit within which independent, quote, nonpartisan, end quote, societal interests can find expression. In order to achieve these overarching objectives, there are at least some tasks that immediately present themselves. First, and in that sense, if we achieve this first task, it will have reflected a certain uh, quality of subordination of partisan interests. Because the fact is, the last time we had any real um, 
far-reaching collaboration around constitutional matters was when we agreed to assume independence. Since then, we have not been able to find common cause to deliver any substantial, as distinct from marginal, constitutional reform. I think the first challenge is to is to complete the constitutional reform agenda agreed by the Joint Select Committee of Parliament more than a decade ago. A critical feature of those reform proposals imposed a requirement for bipartisan agreement in the selection and appointment of membership to critical offices of state in the Police Services Commission, Public Service Commission, and the like. This would go a far way from eliminating the prospect and the fear of partisan manipulation of these institutions and of state functions generally. Outstanding issues that remain to be settled, including the uh, mode of appointment of the president and the size and composition of the Senate could be settled quickly and uh, with the appropriate political will and the willingness to compromise. Secondly, I believe a determined effort must be made to strengthen the deliberative capacities of the parliament. This includes but goes beyond the issue of adequate parliamentary facilities. Somewhat paradoxically, parliament has simultaneously been the scene of partisan excess and superficiality, and at the same time, the site of some of the most constructive and deliberative undertakings, um, engaging representatives of both major parties. In my experience, the workings of the increasingly well elabor elaborated system of committees that have been established reveal parliament at its best. The ability to find common cause to negotiate through differences of position and come out with working legislation or proposals for the enhancement of governance is possible. Indeed, in recognition of this, the recently promulgated fiscal responsibility framework and the, and the fiscal rules legislation that has just been passed, which is, going, which is essential to any effort to reduce the debt to the levels legislated as 60% by 2025, places specific responsibility on parliamentary committees. In this instance, the public appropriate public administration and appropriations committee to monitor and constrain the buildup of public debt, to supervise the public sector investment program and eliminate, hopefully, uh, patterns of whimsical project development for. Um, well, let's leave it at that. <laughs> Um, in turn, however, for these deliberations to be meaningful, parliamentarians will need much more support in terms of the staffing of parliament, research facilities, advice, much more than is presently available. Third, I believe we need to ensure the passage of the legislation to create a single anti-corruption agency with the requisite powers of investigation and prosecution. There is perhaps no single issue which saps public confidence in government than the specter of corruption and which impedes our capacity for collective action. The suspicion of public corruption has been long with us. And despite the passage of various pieces of legislation this, and the strengthening of extensive requirements for the reporting of incomes by public officials, there is still a strong perception that public corruption persists and has in fact worsened. Addressing this problem is an urgent national priority. 
All of this will impose a particular challenge to national leadership. I just don't mean here party political leadership. Westminster style politics implies collaborative politics. It implies a commitment to find common cause in the national interest when fundamental challenges emerge, even as we undertake the competition between parties, which is also essential to the functioning of the system. This challenge, however, meeting this challenge, however, will impose not only a great test on the national leadership of the political parties, but I dare say on the wider range of leadership within the society as a whole, because in the end, the country doesn't belong to the political parties. It belongs to all Jamaicans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Peter Phillips. And can we have another round of applause? <laughs> Please. Uh, we, we, we started late, but nonetheless, we're going to try to have, if, if anybody from the floor wishes to ask questions, we have one mic in the audience, and we're recording. So we prefer if you, uh, Percy, if you, if you go to the mic. Um, and uh, is there anybody else? Uh, we, we, we could take a few questions. I don't think we can have as many as I would have liked, uh, given our time constraints. But uh, we have a few. Can you make them short and pointed and not give... Um, uh, lessons in history. Um, for me. I, I know you. I know you. You're not going to do that, I'm not. Uh, 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 Professor Percy. Um, Mr. Phillips, thanks. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Isn't the fundamental problem the world democracy? And I'm, I'm asking you this because your um, your former professor. Imani, this is the point of your former professor Emmanuel Waterstein. And, and what he says was that the introduction of liberal democracy uh, created the conditions uh, for the undermining of popular sovereignty uh, through forms of meritocracy. Now, specifically in Jamaica, you know, every time I come to Jamaica, I'm, I'm sort of um, enamored of, 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 of the wealth that we see here, you know, um, notwithstanding the fact that um, the, the high public debt, the increase in poverty, but, but, but people are buying Mercedes Benzes in the United States that are costing $120,000. And, and the houses that, that, that you have here, you know, they're million dollar houses. So, so I'm, I'm wondering whether or not, ultimately, uh, we should not measure the effectiveness of, of, of anything by virtue of popular support. Because people popularly supported enslavement, they popularly supported a whole host of other things. Um, is, is there a fundamental problem with liberal democracy because it excludes um, the popular will and it excludes the, the popular capacity to speak for themselves and to engage in um, those things of their choice for their own benefit? Well, I, 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 I don't share that view. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one of the issues, which time certainly didn't permit, that we have to take account of, is the constraint imposed by the global economy, huh? which really limits the range of options available. But certainly, just speaking for myself, and on occasions where I have um, had occasions to, <coughs> to visit, thankfully for short periods, countries in which liberal democratic uh, uh, opportunities, you know, the freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, uh, don't exist. I, I have never found that place, that, that environment to be attractive, despite many other things. Now, I also believe that, that there's a vast history in, of many, in many polities where we have seen the ambit of social rights expanded. I think critically, the, the, there have to be choices made 
and this is where the capacity of the of the of the society and of the democratic practice is going to be tested as to which developmental option should we choose. The heart of the problem, as I see it, has been that the developmental conundrum, so to speak, uh, and has been less, the, the, the challenge as to the allocation of resources to achieve rapid development has been less effectively done in circumstances of liberal democratic practice than otherwise. Now, insofar as we in the Caribbean certainly value liberal democracy and the associated freedoms and place positive and a positive attachment to these values, then what we need to develop alongside it is the ability to determine a pattern for the allocation of resources what will we invest in? What are the long-term trade-offs? Because as, as if you look at the public discourse now, there is, there is a unwillingness to trade off anything, which is just not a, not a practical proposition. Huh? Um, but, but that's going to be the challenge. Any other questions from the floor? Can you identify yourself when you come on, please? Yes, I'm Horace Machos from the Marcus Garvey People's Political Party. Now, in your presentation, Minister, you said um, there was a joint select committee that looked at alternative models. I find it very strange that we are within this model and we know it is not working. The state of Jamaica dictates that it is not working. There are socialist models out there that are working. Why can't we adopt a socialist model which is working? For instance, Switzerland is working. Well, um, I, uh, quite frankly, I think we have to develop our own, our, on the basis of our own experience. Um, we can look at a range of places and, and, and learn from those experiences. But each place has to evolve, in my view, a history out of a, 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 a practice out of our own historical experience. Now, you know, I, I, would, I, I think what we need to look at are what are those features that would allow for wider representation, if you will, um, even within the parliamentary process. At times, at times, I believe there was a time in the in the eighties, in some some unpublicized discussions, we are looking even at issues to look at proportional representation. If some element of proportional representation could be introduced in part of maybe in the Senate for selection or something which would allow for a wider range of voices to be incorporated in the process of um, lawmaking and political decision making. And those are things that I think we should look at. But we're not going to draw the Swedish experience and transfer it here with those traditions or, or anywhere else, quite frankly. Part of what I've been trying to say is that looking even at the court Westminster thing as an inheritance or as a imposition is not strictly accurate or at least in our circumstances it's it's the kind of thing that you know the person in in you know 75 lane and walter park road understands i mean and, and knows what their role should be we want to widen that role and provide greater opportunities. But I think the bulk of those opportunities need to be widened, not just by legislating new roles, although there's a place for that, but it will grow organically. Perhaps the greatest contribution to broadening democracy will be to succeed on providing first-rate education for everyone, 
which is when you can really have effective participation in the decision making on the part of citizens. Can you come forward, please, and um, identify yourself? Uh, I think we have room for a few more questions, so if you, uh, I like how we're moving. Good morning. I'm Helen Wilkinson. I'm very glad that the minister made the point about education, because I know that although the minister of education has said by 2016 they will be trying to dismantle the disenfranchised um, students not being allowed to sit exams because the school decides that they're not at a level. Although governments have, I assume as a minister, you can tell me, have put a purse for students to do all exams. So if the students are being disallowed, at one center I was at, because I do exam management, you have 200 students registered at grade 11 and less than half of them are sitting English language. How will they be able to make out the symbols to vote or how to write an X? So I'd like to tell you, ask you to tell me from the budget what can be done to dismantle that. Because what you have is that you have people in the public service, whether teachers, nurses, whoever, that they're following the colonial pattern. And regardless of a government minister, they have been entrenched in the service for 50 years. So they don't care what a minister can do. They know that a minister is dispensable. And even when a government is in for 18 years, they seem to have more power and oppress, particularly our children in the education system. And I'd like to see if something could be done, yes, if not no, then when? It's 2016, but can it be done this year? Students, the government has already paid for, their SB, for them to do courses. All of a sudden you hear there's something wrong with the SB and that child has to be thrown out and not do the exam. Parents have spent the money, the government has spent the money. We need to do something about that because that is something maybe the government has to make a ruling, just like our Honorable Bruce Golding made a decision to make health system free. Why? Because at the end of the day, what you're really getting is a visit to the doctor. People do know that they will have to make their own checks, but that immediate need to be seen when you have a free health system, that's what you provide to the people of Jamaica. Thank you very much. There is need for a, a, a full discussion about the, the education system and its failings. To me, the issue is not, it's an important, the, what is critical about the screening is not so much whether there is a screening process or there is not a screening process, but that so many people reach that point in their educational experience and are not basically qualified to take the examination. Now, that's a huge failing. Coming after successive um, educational revolution, scholarship 57, that allowed people like myself and others to go to, to, go to high school. And then free education of the 70s and the subsequent changes. The heart of the problem is today that you still have essentially a two-tiered educational system, which is why parents struggle so hard to get students, their children, into one of the so-called traditional high schools, because that is a determination of your life chances. You know? You have one set of schools that produce a quality of education equal to almost anywhere in the world, and another set of schools where you have too few getting a chance. And I think that is the challenge, to eliminate that distinction and the basis for that distinction between the traditionals and non-traditionals. And I think that that is what is being approached. You know, there was an interesting thing. The, the government provided money for four subjects. I don't, don't hold me to the exact numbers. Maths, English, a science subject, and there was one other. And the money was paid over, but you found that a whole number of the students didn't take it, just didn't go, because they were just, their education had not qualified them. That is the tragedy, that is the urgent challenge that has to be addressed. Now, there are a host of factors that go into it, which we 
which I don't think we have time to deal with now. But, but I think that is one of the lessons of our history. All after 1838, if there is one lesson that we learned and which the parents who aspired learned, that the key to liberation for the propertyless in particular was to get a good education churches and everything, all the whole free village movement was organized around delivering that. But we have not adequately met that challenge in the period since 1962. I'll take, uh, uh, Prime Minister. No, please, please, yeah, 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 yeah. yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ralph Gonzalez. No, I listened very carefully to Peter, and I ask questions and what we have to ponder on. How can we build a satisfactory model of governance? where large numbers of persons are permanently dissatisfied, where dissatisfaction is the lot. Now, it is true that in the human condition, we are, most of us are in hunt for glory and avid for gain. And very often, our desires are insatiable in that our own circumstances and that of the society can't fulfill what we desire. So we are permanently dissatisfied. How do we address this? Because it's a problem in, in democracies all over the world, in societies all over the world. It's not only a problem for Politics is a problem also for theology, and particularly so for theology, where it's amazing that Christians who see redemptive promise as the, the ultimate, they themselves are permanently dissatisfied when they should be very happy that there's a promise that things should get better. <laughs> so that's, 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 that's one. The, the, second, the second issue, Peter, is the fueling of this dissatisfaction by the internet, which is something which we haven't touched on yet, but which is in any model of governance we have to be addressing this issue because the, the, the information technology is breaking down authority systems in the families and in institutions of one kind in governance and the like. So that's and then, with this dissatisfaction being fueled in a context of relative scarcity, you pointed that out, and where the state is the single largest employer or dispenser of goods and services, and therefore the battle for the state is a life and death one for many persons, including those who are permanently dissatisfied, hoping that they will become satisfied. Now, many of the reforms that we are talking about would help, but I don't know whether we reach yet um, this uh, a point where we can we can solve this this conundrum. So I. I I put that in sometimes, if we don't have all the solutions before us, we grope towards them. And it's a process of, of learning. This is not to say that what we have, as you have asserted, has done very well and is keeping us in a much better condition than several other places. I just want to say this. The search is in, in to me, I was very, I was a little taken aback, um, but, but quite understanding that a follower of Gavi would look to Switzerland as the model, which itself shows that all of us are looking 
at all different places, and therefore we must not close our minds. Thank you. No, I, I, I won't follow. I, I won't follow Ralph's theology, but but I think the the the, the basic is you know, and it is an issue which can be posed by competing experiences, even in the Commonwealth Caribbean. Take out the oil. I mean, the Trinidad case. But why, why have some succeeded more than others in being able to reduce the degree of the dissatisfaction, if, even if the theology dictates permanent dissatisfaction. That's today's world, in a sense. You know, it's like you have different reasons for non-participation in, in, in the US. Levels of electoral participation have been notoriously minimal. But much of that is because people figure that, well, they are reasonably satisfied. We have had high levels of Non when we have non-participation here, it is reflecting dissatisfaction for the most part. Now, yes, exactly. But that makes the point. The, the, you mean the participation rates? Because it has delivered more. I mean, you have, you have ranging per capita incomes in the region. You have countries knocking on the door of developed country levels, including Bahamas, and others, in our case, which has stagnated over the years. It is that stagnation in the context of our unequal income distribution, which leaves a, a vast mass of the population. Yes, the Bahamas has 300,000 people, but they have, what, 100 and something murders a year? Yeah. So, 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 so the, 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 the issue well, is a complicated business. Yeah, but they, they, yeah, I don't want to, you know, part of the thing, well, the, the one thing about our situation, you know, is that we were, we were between the devil and the United States, or the, <laughs> or between South America and the devil, any way you want to put it. I mean, that's the organized traffic, you know, God decreed, or nature or you know the shape of the world that we should be situated one night sail from the main cocaine producing regions and one night sail from the main cocaine consuming regions of the world and Bahamas is even yeah more more affected but the challenge is the challenge for our democratic politics and the answer to your thing is to to reduce the degree of that dissatisfaction by defining an economic project that doesn't leave everyone, so many, on the margins. And that, in turn, would have required some sustained, some sustained commitments to some national projects that don't, that, and it is not the case that we have pulled them up every five years or whenever there's a change of government. But I would dare say we ought to have had more um, national projects, certainly in relation to the economy and education, which could attract a consensus that was more durable and not affected by the electoral cycle. Thank you. Uh, I see a lovely line of people there, but we, we really have some time constraints. What I'm going to suggest is that if you really have long questions, I mean, we have two days in front of us. If you have very short questions in which you just want a quick answer, then please come up and, 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 and make them. But I'm going to cut off in, in, in five minutes' time. We're already 15 minutes over the time limit for this session. All right, good morning, Mr. Minister. My name is Andre Shackleford. I'm an associate lecturer in the Department of Physics, a tutor in the law faculty, and a student at the Norman Mandel Law School. Um, yes, physics. Thank you. Yes. In, 
<laughs> I understand. In relation to the Westminster model, it of course involves a charter of fundamental rights, the provisions dealing with the executive, judiciary, and the legislature. And one important element of this is the prosecutorial, the director of public prosecutions, who has a sort of ultimate power to commence, take over, and stop any prosecution. Now, two things. You mentioned an anti-corruption agency. So the first question is whether or not that's, uh, that's still a thought bouncing around, or that's a bill that's been introduced into parliament that to commence that. that. OK. And secondly, being in the parliament, and in relation to prosecutorial power generally, um, and this being vested in one individual, now the director of public prosecutions is, in most jurisdictions, appointed in a similar manner to a judge of the high court. In Jamaica, it's a bit different, and the worst is Bahamas, where it's actually the attorney general, who is a political figure. So the question is, in relation to that broad power that this one individual has, of course, your, your, your zest for this anti-corruption agency answers the question to an extent. But outside of corruption, in relation to the division of prosecutorial power, outside of this one individual, I'd just like your thoughts on that, especially since that's a key feature of the Westminster model. Part of, part of our, uh, the circumstance in which our constitutional arrangements were made, mean, namely by, by codifying it, made it more rigid, perhaps, than we are it in the original heartland in the UK. And so you had, in this, many of the, fears, concerns, and circumstances of 1962, where there was a great concern on the part of British authorities about the, and, and I dare say the local, or the local competing party leaderships, that the great risk was a political manipulation of the whole state. And therefore, we created a constitution that is very rigid to change and where key offices of state were, give, were granted monopolies. Not, nothing, although I am not, I, I, I dislike monopolies, not only in matters of economics, but also in most other spheres of life, except perhaps marriage. <laughs> um, but but, but um, I believe that we have this rigidity, which is almost impossible to overcome in terms of the grant of the prosecutorial power. You can't give everybody willy-nilly that power, but I don't think it has to be confined necessarily. I mean, all my views here, I should, I should say, are personal. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, uh, I, yeah, I was kind of forgetting myself a bit. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but, you know, I think that, and in the particular circumstances of this act, what is proposed is that the power of the director of public prosecutions to stop a prosecution is retained. Huh? but there is the power to prosecute. And I think the courts have also ruled in relation to Indicom that they do have the power to bring prosecutions and others. That, you know, it's a... And remember, well, it was agreed in the Constitutional Court Committee that the DPP would know be subject to judicial review. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, a recent Privy Council case out of Antigua has made the point, reaffirmed the point, that the commission of police can institute a criminal proceeding. If you can stop, stop it, take yeah, it over, yeah. stop it. But it doesn't take away the power of the commission of police to initiate mm -hmm. criminal proceedings. There's a recent judgment in April. In the very relation to? Privy Council Antigua and Bar Antigua. Hi, Pat, a very quick question because we are up to time now. So, okay. and, and a quick response from the minister and then we. All right. We'll um, good morning, everyone. I'm Pat Northover from Salisas, a senior fellow here. 
Um, first of all, I just want to say um, my respect and condolences to the, to the government on the passing of Roger Clark, and Honorable Minister Roger Clark. Um, I know that it has deeply affected the administration across party lines. And as a member of the institute representing us all, I wanted to pay our condolences to him. Um, you mentioned that there was an issue raised related to going back to our own sense of our history to negotiate um, some of the challenges to achieve development. And I'd like to suggest one concept that exists within that historical um, experiences, especially within the Caribbean, and that is the concept of limbo, making space where there's little or none, where there are fundamental constraints to be achieved. Making space where there's little or none. Limbo? Okay. Limbo, okay. Um, the question in relationship to some of the hard constraints that has been imposed by the, the um, IMF program, the um, sector adjustment program. Um, in business planning, there are four variables which are tended to examine in terms of hard constraints. I want to identify what those are and then I want to ask the question. There is the political, the economic, Pat, the social, please, and go the to the question for me. We're really yeah. under time constraint. I just want constraint. to make this. Please, go to the question this, for me. This point. Um, the economic should be really encompassed with the environmental, which represents a tsunami to any decision or prospect for development for small states. So the question is, um, are there any strategic variables along which this administration is seeking to negotiate space in relationship to the debt to GDP criterions of 60% to 2025 and the primary surplus criterion of 7% GDP within this fiscal year. The second is, who are the key agents to be mobilized to facilitate the strategic response to these hard constraints? And how, would you, intend, how do you intend to support that process authentically? Thank you. I'll be, I'll be brief. I, this needs a fuller discussion. My, my, my own, that debt to GDP ratio can come down if the more we exceed the growth targets that we have. I mean, that's where, in fact, I, I am putting the emphasis in trying to um, achieve greater flexibility. The 7.5% would also change and it certainly can't last. Um, it's, it's not sustainable for any long, long period of time. Uh, but the debt, the debt, whatever we feel about the, the, the justice of the situation, the fact of the matter is that there needs to be a global initiative to deal with the debt overhang in the Caribbean. You know, but it reminds of the old adage. They say, oh, your banker, a thousand dollars, you lose sleep. Oh, him ten million dollars, he loses sleep. Now, the fact of the matter is, as one country, we, 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 we are not in the position simply to withstand all the consequences, especially in the context of our openness and, and dependence on trade relationships. The, the Argentina option is not really available um, here. So um, mobilizing the agencies to achieve some growth, we can go deal with more specificity over time. Yep. Oh, the other questions finished. Okay. Thanks very much, Peter. I know it's it's um we've had to contract, and I apologize to the last people asking questions uh, for that. Um, we're a little behind time, uh, but once again, I'd like uh, to uh, applaud the minister for coming and addressing us. No, very, very quickly before we leave, uh, I'm going to, we have a coffee break now, uh, just some, some matters of business. Uh, we invite um, conference participants to the coffee break. Uh, there's a special line for those who have the tags on um, to get through quickly so you can get back to the session. But everybody is, we have 
coffee, I think, until we run out for everybody else as well. Um, um, we, uh, we are going to resume, we're going to try to re resume at around 11.15. So we'll only be 15 minutes behind time as opposed to half an hour or so that we are now. Um, we have a series of very interesting panels. Lunch is available for conference participants uh, and, and will be served in the room uh, when you leave here to the left at the end of the corridor. Um, again, we, we entrance is free, but we don't have lunch for everybody. That is the, the order of business as we, we can manage it. Um, the next panel uh, after tea, after coffee rather, is Westminster and Historical Perspective and we'll have uh, Richard Drayton and Hamid Ghani uh, presenting their papers. We do urge you uh, to have coffee and to attend. And uh, let me remind you very quickly that among our highlights are, uh, you have already heard Prime Minister Gonzalez intervening freely, and he will continue intervening uh, with his keynote address at, at five this afternoon. We're hoping to, to get as close to that time as possible. Mr. Bruce Golding will be addressing us at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Uh, with his uh, address. And tomorrow afternoon at 5.30, we'll be launching a book which takes us a little bit away from the theme, but perhaps not that very far away from the theme, uh, Black Power in the Caribbean, edited by, by uh, Dr. Kate Quinn. So uh, enjoy the remainder of our conference seminar and uh, look forward to seeing you in 15 to 20 minutes time back in here. Thank you. <laughs>